God, the Lamb of God is He. He's the Son of David, the King of all ages, eternal life. Holy Lord of glory, His name. And some called him devil because of his power. You see, they just could not understand. And some named him a blasphemer. They refused to accept him as anything more than just a man. He's master, savior, lion of Judah, the blessed prince of peace. He's a shepherd, a fortress, the rock of salvation, the Lamb of God is He. He's the Son of David, the King. They cut me off before I could sing it. <laughs> I reckon not. I won't disappoint them then. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you in just a little bit, who is Christ to you? And uh, that song there just named it very, very well. So we'll, we'll look at that again in a little bit. <clears throat> I want us to go to prayer, and uh, I have a very updated prayer list. It's dated 12, 12, 1222, <clears throat> so undoubtedly nothing's happened since then, so I probably have all the sick on here, but we'll go over it and see. If not, I'll let Mary fill us in because she certainly got all of them. <clears throat> we want to continue to pray for Bill Blunt. Um, Mother and David and <clears throat> are here, but we want to continue yeah. to pray for them. Becky, Maria and Ricky, of course Mary Falls, Shirley Grantham, Kelly Martin. I saw Kelly. Did I say, yeah, there's Kelly sitting way back there where I can't hardly see her. <clears throat> Donna Oberry, Maria Oliver, 
Julie Peacock, and Julie's right there. Good to see Julie said she was feeling fine. Brother Ed is not doing well, and I pray for him. Junior Sapp, I talked with Junior today and, and uh, yesterday, and Junior was going back to Jacksonville today, and I didn't hear anything. So pray for Junior. Uh, Bobby Walltower. Chris O'Berry is not doing well. He's having a lot of problems with his back, and Becky's going to come and stand in for him in just a little bit. <clears throat> Miss Margaret Clark passed away, and it's Tommy's mother, um, Richard's mother, and uh, Tommy Smith's sister. And the funeral will be, the visitation will be Friday night from 5 to 7. Is that right, Jimmy? 5 to 7. Funeral at 11 o'clock. The, the visitation will be at Music's 5 to 7 Friday night. And then the funeral will be here 11 o'clock Saturday morning. So pray for Richard and all the family and Tommy and all of them <clears throat> as they go through this. 5 to 7 Friday night visitation at Music. 11 o'clock funeral here at the church. Nona and Farrell, I assume, are still sick. I don't see them here, so I guess they're still sick. All right. Who wants to mention the request now? I know I've missed some, so who? Maria? All right, Robbie. Okay. Jimmy? I see Johnny sitting back. Then I wonder where Carolyn was. So she's had the flu. I can't. I can't hear all of you. What did you say, Johnny? I had pneumonia. All right. Well, I didn't know that. So okay. <clears throat> Pray for Carolyn. Who's talking? All right. All right. Okay. Brother Benny, uh, Tommy Green's niece passed away. That's the ambush window. His his what? His niece. his niece. Tommy's niece passed away. All right. All right. Who else? Gang. All right. <clears throat> Leland, all right. Kelly. Okay, you have unspoken requests tonight. All right, <clears throat> I'm doing a, a whole lot better, and I thank you for your, your prayers. Um, Um, mine, mine is a viral infection, and um, I 
I want you to just, just continue to pray uh, for me to get rid of all of this. Um, pray for those in the nursing homes. Certainly lift them up tonight. And uh, I know there's a lot of sickness going around here, so keep all those in your prayers. And then as we come together tonight to pray, um, pray for one another. Um, this stuff can hit you in a moment's notice, just like anything else can happen. So we need to pray for one another for strength and uh, for God to keep us safe. So if you will, Jimmy, I'm going to ask you to come up and lead us in prayer. And the rest of you, just come and let's stand here or come and sit or sit where you are. Let's all use this time of the time of prayer to gather with one another. <clears throat> <clears throat> Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true.
prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living
better. I was making sure everybody was out of recess. That's what I was doing. So go ahead. back here uh, if you're new in the church um, for your income tax Don, uh, Donna has fixed the tithing forms back here in the kitchen that uh, post office that's mounted on the walls in alphabetical order your tithing envelopes there go back there and get it and it'll be ready for you also there are a bunch of Christmas cards back there that you have not gotten yet so they're on the uh, counter in the kitchen also you need to pick those up i'll tell you what jimmy told you sunday if somebody thinks enough of you to write your card you ought to get your card out because they might not send you one next year if they find out you didn't want this one this year so your cards are back there please get them and your tithe envelopes are back there make sure you get them <clears throat> um board of deacons meeting tonight as soon as we get through here back in the back um Prayer Saturday night here, and then church on Sunday. And uh, look forward to that and, and be praying. I want to tell you that um, we had a, a, a good time on our vacation. Uh, we saw snow one day. And uh, <clears throat> other than that, we just... Stayed inside most of the time. Tegan and Jack, uh, Tegan and Brody were sick most of the trip. Uh, Brody got sick going up, and um, Tegan got sick after we got there. And they finally took Tegan to the uh, convenient carry, and he, they said they thought he had the flu, but they weren't sure. Uh, what he had was viral, and uh, he just didn't get better. So we came on back home a day early, and. Uh, that's probably where I got mine, but it's like I told Tish, I'd do it all over again a hundred times and not worry about it. Being with them and trying to help take care of, of the boys was, um, if you're a parent, you understand that, and I'd do it all over again a hundred times. I have no problem whatsoever with it, <clears throat> but I'm sorry. Dawson was scheduled to speak this past Sunday before I ever left. He... Um, that we'd already worked on that, but uh, whenever Richard's mother turned for the worst, he was scheduled to speak at while I was gone, but he couldn't. So Dawson and um, Christopher just jumped right in there and said, "We'll do it." And I, you know, that was that was wonderful for them to have that kind of an attitude. So that's why they both spoke that Sunday, and then, like I said, Dawson was already scheduled to speak this Sunday, and then I was supposed to speak Sunday night, but. Um, that didn't work out, and, and Jimmy, I, he got ready Sunday afternoon because I, I, I waited to the last minute thinking I could do it. And uh, Jimmy got ready the last minute, and Jimmy just says, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And uh, Lord knows he does. And I watched the services um, on the Internet. Uh, if Some of y'all told me the other day you didn't know we did that. We, we, we broadcast every service. This, this service here is broadcast. Go on YouTube. Um, you can go to your internet and pull up Kettle Creek Church live, and it'll bring it up. If not, go to YouTube. It's on there. And now we're doing music and all. We're trying to get it all worked out, and we're doing music and all. So you can go on there and see it live, but if you miss it, we've got all of our services archived all the way back. I don't know how far. You can go in and pull up anything you want to and watch it. So we are live, and we are on the air. So I encourage you to watch it and encourage other people to to help to tell them, let them get out there and watch it. You never know when it'll make a difference. So <clears throat> I did watch it, and I was very pleased. I, I told Jimmy, 
I thought perhaps he had done the best I've seen him do yet. He keeps getting better and better. And uh, it comes from, it comes from uh, the more you do it, the better it gets and the easier it gets. And, and you learn to trust God more. And when you learn to trust God more, God can do anything. So I was well pleased with what went on. And thank you all for taking care of everything. And um, I'm glad to be back. <clears throat> and just pray. You continue to pray for me. i got to get all this cleared up. So you keep praying for me. Now, <clears throat> we're, going to, we're going to talk about fellowship for a little bit. In the book of Colossians, I'm going to read two different things. In the book of Colossians, chapter 1, one verse says, simply says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And what that is, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I've used this scripture before in a different way. The mystery is Christ in you. It's a mystery. He's talking to the Gentiles. He, uh, he had already carried the message to the Jews. And now he's going to the Gentiles and said, this mystery, which you don't know about because it wasn't brought to you, now it is being brought to you. And we're going to reveal this mystery to you. And the mystery is simply this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I want to take that statement and I want to go back <clears throat> and read to you. <clears throat> What led up to this and what immediately follows? I'm going to do a different translation, so I want you just to listen for a minute. Paul said to the Gentiles, You now have been saved. You've been cleansed of your sins, been made whole, and there is a place prepared for you in heaven. So this goes along with God said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, anyone, the worst of us, Christ now has a way. And he said to accept this and to receive this, the only condition is that you fully believe the truth. Amen. Now listen to it. One, fully believe the truth which is the word of God, then you've got to stand in that truth steadfast. You've got to believe it and then make a stand. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I'll stand in it. You've got to be firm and strong in the Lord. I know all of our minds are racing. It'll get by in just a minute. <clears throat> The only condition is that you fully believe the truth, stand in that truth steadfast and firm, be strong in the Lord, convinced of the good news that Jesus died for you, and never shifting away from trusting him to save you. This is the wonderful news that came to each of you, the mystery, and is now spreading all over the world. And I, Paul, had the joy of telling it to others. Now, Paul started with that statement there. He described to them what they had and where they were in Christ. And he says, now, to receive, and, and, and to receive the promises of God, you got to do these things. That's what I just said to you. Believe, stand fast, and so on. Now, in the next part, he goes into a different part. And I want you to listen to this. He said, but, Paul talking, part of my work is to suffer for you. Now, isn't that interesting how he goes from telling them the greatness of God and what they had to do to suffer or what they had to do to receive it and keep it. And then he said, but now my job is to suffer for you. You need to think about that one for a moment. Paul said, my job is to suffer for you. Hmm. And I'm glad to do so. For I am helping to finish up the remainder of Christ's suffering for his body, the church. So Paul said, now my job is to suffer for you because I got to finish up Christ's sufferings. 
So Paul was suffering to finish up where Christ's sufferings went off, he said, where it ended. Okay. God has sent me to help the church and to tell the <clears throat> secret plan to the Gentiles. He has kept this secret for centuries and so on and so on. And then he says the, the secret is Christ in your hearts is your only hope of glory. So wherever we go, we talk about Christ to all who will listen, warning them and teaching them as well as we know how. We want to be able to present each one to God perfect because of what Christ has done for each of them. This is my work, and I can do it only because Christ's mighty energy is at work within me. So he told them what they had, how to keep it, what they had to do. And then he says, my job now is to suffer for you, to finish the suffering that Christ started. So he says, <clears throat> we want, I do, I'm doing this so that you can presented, be presented to Christ perfect. Now we know that there's none of us that are perfect. And the truth is, we never will be until we get to heaven. But the other part of that statement is that we have been made perfect through Christ. We are not perfect. We have been made perfect through Christ. Nothing we can do to make ourselves perfect. But we've been made perfect through Christ. So Paul says, this is what you've got. You've got to live it. I've come to suffer so that you can be made perfect before Christ. Now, I want us to think about that for a little bit tonight, and I want to, I, I, we, we have to ask the question, what, what is Paul saying that we've got to do in order for us to become and stay and maintain our life as a Christian so that one day we can be made perfect before Christ and presented to him? So I'll begin by asking you tonight, and I don't want anybody to answer out loud, loud, are you a Christian? Now think of your answer. And I'm sure that every one of us in here will say, yes, I certainly am. And I would certainly hope that you are, that we all are believers together in Christ. I mean, why else would you come to church on a Wednesday night? So I pray that we all are. But the next question I would ask you is then, what does it mean to be a Christian? If you tell me you are a Christian, then what are you? What makes you a Christian? What makes you different from the world? What, what is there out there that gives you the right to call yourself a Christian? I can ask, ask, well, let's just assume in here tonight, Joey was not here, so well, I think we can assume, basically, Tim's not here, that we're all Georgia Bulldogs. Let's just assume that. <laughs> okay? Let's just assume that. Now, are you a Georgia Bulldog fan, or are you a Georgia Bulldog? Two different things, isn't it? Georgia Bulldog fan is one that's for them when they're winning. Don't care so much when they're for them when they're losing. A Georgia Bulldog is one that's born and bred, paid the price, went there. I'm a Georgia Bulldog. I went there. But there's a lot of people that's a Georgia Bulldog fan. They jump on the bandwagon. They didn't pay the price. So the same principle holds true when I ask you, are you a Christian or are you a Christian fan? See, a Christian is one that sold out, went there, paid the price, 
Got the salvation, is steadfast, living it for Christ. A fan is one that serves him whenever things are going good and runs away when things are bad. A fan is one who serves him until his eye catches something else, then he follows something else. A fan is one who loves like Jesus says until someone does him wrong, then they, that love goes away. A fan is one who likes to go to church on Sunday and live for the devil during the rest of the week. A fan is one who comes to church on Sunday morning and doesn't have to come on Sunday night nor Wednesday. You see, what are you? You're a fan or you're a Christian? And this is what Paul was trying to address them. He says, listen, God died for you. He forgave you your sin. He made you whole and well. He's prepared a home for you in heaven. Now all that you have to do, you see, is not be a fan, but to live the Christian life. Believe it. Trust it. Hold steadfast. Walk in it no matter what. You've got the stamp of God on your heart. You've been, sa- you've been sealed by God. And now the world needs to know that you, that you are what you are. I've got my ring. It's got the dates and stuff on there when I went to Georgia, so it's here. So God says, the same as this is makes me a bulldog. You have the seal of Christ on your life. And in order to stand out just as obvious as this does to people that you are God's child. That you were saved, you believe it, you accepted it, you believe the word of God, you walk in it, you're steadfast, and you're moving towards heaven. And you're not going to be, you know, not going to be swayed one way or the other by whether the Christians are winning or losing. You're steadfast. So, are you a Christian or are you a fan? <coughs> <coughs> Now, John, John, in his gospel, said this. We are telling you about what we have seen and heard because we want you to have fellowship with us. The fellowship we share together is with God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, John tries to describe it a little bit different than Paul did. Paul said, are you a Christian or are you a fan? Then John says, well, Paul goes on to say, I suffer for you to finish the suffering that Christ started. John said, I've received Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I have fellowship with him, and I also have fellowship with you. So John says, I'm his, I have fellowship with him, and I have fellowship with you. But if we are living in the light of God's presence, just as Christ does, then we have wonderful fellowship and joy with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. So get, get the picture now. John says, I, am, I have been forgiven of my sins. I believe the word is the truth, and I stand in that word, and I do not waver. And I have fellowship with the Father, and I have fellowship with you. So John is showing you a picture of, of what a Christian is, not a Christian fan, a Christian, one who has fellowship with the Father and one who has fellowship with each other. Now, the word fellowship here <clears throat> is, 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 is two or more people enjoying the company of one another, fellowship. Fellowship is two people in a boat sharing something. When, 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 we, go, when we go fishing, <clears throat> And there's two people in a boat. You got one in front and one in the back. The one in the front gets to get to all the fishing holes first. Then when you come along in the back, you get to catch what he doesn't catch. See? The guy in the front has to run the trolling motor. The guy in the back doesn't. 
And the guy in the front, if he, get, if he breaks his line, he usually pulls out to the middle of the stream to fix his line, and you have to come out there with him, even though your line's ready and you could be fishing. See, there's a lot that happens in a boat with two people. But to have fellowship in a boat doesn't mean you're just in there, two people in a boat. It is two people sharing. The one in the back has to respect the one in the front. The one in the front has to respect the one in the back. And you each have a responsibility in that boat, and you learn to love and have fellowship in a boat. It doesn't matter whether you're in the front of the, whether you're in the front or the back of the boat or whether you're in the middle of the stream or the, the uh, back of the stream. It doesn't make any difference where you are or what you're doing. It's having fellowship, loving and trusting one another, and enjoying one another's company. That is fellowship. Just being in a boat is not fellowship. I've been in boats before where it was not fellowship. I'll guarantee you that. And I couldn't wait to get out and swore I'd never go back with that person again. But there are certain people I love to get in the boat with because we have fellowship. We have a good time. Mike Zachary is one of them. Every time we've ever been fishing, we've had fellowship. And it didn't matter whether we were fishing or whether we were riding. It didn't make any difference. We were having fellowship in a boat. And sometimes we even caught some fish, didn't we, Mike? You see, fellowship. So it doesn't matter whenever Paul said, I'm having fellowship with God. To have fellowship with God, it means that whatever God believes, he believes. See, it's a part of him. You can only have fellowship with God when part of you is God. Your understanding, your knowledge, your wisdom is of God, so you, now you have fellowship. And you can only have fellowship with one another when you're like believers, when you believe the same thing, when you're living for the same thing and you're striving for the same thing, you have fellowship. And Paul said, John said, I have fellowship with my father and I have fellowship with you. The fellowship that he had with his father was holy. It was pure. Therefore, the fellowship that he had with one another was holy and pure. The fellowship with God should be the same fellowship that you have with one another. And if you have fellowship with God, you have to have fellowship with your other believers or you don't have fellowship with God. It's not a thing where you just do it with God and it's over with. You have to take that and send it here. You have to be willing to give of yourself. And that's exactly what Paul said when Paul said, I now suffer for you. I, Paul, Paul was, was telling us, I have fellowship with the Father because I'm a Christian. He's my Father. And what he believes, I believe, and I'm striving for it. And I'm holding steadfast to it. I believe in it, so I'm having fellowship here. But now i got to suffer for you so that you can have fellowship with the Father and have a home in heaven. So Paul said, I'm willing to go into the highways and the byways and compel those people that are not Christians with the gospel of Jesus Christ and try to show them that Jesus loves them and try to help them understand. The Gentiles, remember when I told you, he's gone to the Gentiles, the dogs, the unbelievers. He was taking the gospel to them. And he says, now you've received it. And now I've got to suffer for you. I've got to teach you things that I already know. I've got to go over them again. I've got to now try to teach you those things my father has taught me. My father taught me, listen to this. My father <clears throat> taught me how to fellowship with him through love. His grace and his mercy came to me. And he and I now can fellowship because he has blessed me and anointed me with grace and mercy and love. Therefore, now I've got to take that same thing and bring it to you and suffer for you with grace and love and mercy. My father died for me so that I could be saved. I've got to be willing to die for you to take you the gospel. That's fellowship. It's just not two people in a boat. It's two people fellowshipping in a boat, two people thinking alike in a boat, two people working in a boat. And he said, I've learned of my father to appreciate what he's given me so that I can fellowship with him. And now I've got to give it to you in such a way that you can learn to appreciate what I'm giving to you so you can fellowship together with me. Do you see that picture? Isn't that beautiful? 
fellowship. That's what it takes for us to be able to call ourselves a Christians. We become connected to Jesus Christ. We have a personal relationship with Christ. We know Christ in our heart, not just in our head. I'll ask you again, how many of you tonight call yourself a Christian? Then how many of you have a personal relationship with Christ? Well, then I have to ask you, what is a personal relationship? Then how do you define that? Does that mean you call him by his first name, God? What is a personal relationship? It's been so far back, I don't remember, but David helps me sometimes. He reminds me, but back when I was dating, I had relationships with girls. Holy relationships. And I had a, a lot of girls I liked, but I only had a few that I had a personal relationship with. That I would want them to be my girlfriend. And I had very few that I had a personal relationship with that I wanted to go steady with. That's what we called it back then. And I only had one that I had a personal relationship with, with that I wanted to marry. So see, you can, I, could, I could have relationships with a lot of girls, but they weren't that special to me. But then there were some that were. See, we can have relationships in the world, but we need personal relationships with God's people because we have something in common. Relationships. Fellowship. Because we have something in common. And that's what we've got to learn as God's children. What, what makes you a Christian? Believe in the Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Listening to everything and believing everything I tell you doesn't make you a Christian. Believing your Sunday school teacher doesn't make you a Christian. See, what makes you a Christian? Believing in heaven and hell doesn't make you a Christian. Believing in miracles, believing that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, believing that Jesus lives today doesn't make you a Christian. The devil believes every one of those things. He knows it. So that doesn't make us a Christian. It is a personal relationship with Christ where you have fellowship with him every day of your life. Makes you a Christian. To accept God's word as truth to walk in it, to live it, and be steadfast, having a personal relationship and fellowship with God every day, then you can call yourself a Christian. I ask you again, are you a Christian? You see, we have, we have to answer that question. Peter said, I, I heard the truth with my heart. We, we hear it too many times with our heads. You see, there'll be a lot of people in here that come in here that, that don't listen to what I say. They hear me all right. But it doesn't go any farther than their head. It never detours and gets in their heart. And one day God is going to hold us responsible for what's in our heart and what's not in our heart. Head knowledge goes away with a head cold. Heart knowledge stays through any trial and tribulation you'll ever face in life. Which do we have? And if we've got heart knowledge, then why aren't we having fellowship with the Father like we should and fellowship with one another? And I'll tell you something. We do not have fellowship with one another because we do not have fellowship with our Father. Now, there will be very few amens on that one because that hurts. How many friends you got in this church that you call real friends? What, what, how, how many people in this church do you fellowship with? Think about it. We come in, we walk out, don't we? You ever go to their house? You ever, they ever invite you to their house? You invite them to your house? Fellowship. What is fellowship? Fellowship is not seeing somebody on Sunday and saying hey to them. And then I'll see you next Sunday. See, that's not Fellowship. 
If that is fellowship, then it's okay to just, just to talk to God on Sundays and never bother him anymore. But God said a daily, a daily relationship with him is fellowship every day. Be constant in prayer. Always. Fellowship. Talking to God. Sharing with God. Listening to God. Isn't that the same thing we have here? That's why it says you're, you're blessed if you can say you have five friends in a lifetime. Five friends. Because a friend is more than someone you speak to. It's someone you have fellowship with. Someone you can share with. Someone you can pray with. Someone that you can be with. Fellowship. Fellowship sometimes is going to their house and eating with them. Sometimes it's going out and eating with them. Sometimes it's joining other things. But you having fellowship. It's not just sitting in church and wave across the aisle. That's not fellowship. So I ask you again, are you a Christian? And we lack fellowship here because we lack fellowship there. If we had the fellowship here that we should have with God, then we would be able to say what Paul did. Now, I must suffer for you. Suffer for you. I've got to give everything that I have, even no matter what it costs me, for you. Because I desire your fellowship. I desire your fellowship. That's a constant relationship. I desire it. So I'm willing to give you everything I have, even to the point of suffering for you, so I can give you what me and my father have. Is that not interesting? Oh, thank you for the enthusiasm. I appreciate it. How many of us are willing to suffer for each other, to go out of our way, to give everything that we have? I don't give a rip what it costs us. Give everything that we have for one another. I told you many times, David went to Vietnam and took the second term so I wouldn't have to go. I eventually got turned down, but he didn't know that. At that time, I didn't either. So he was willing to give everything, everything for me at that moment. How many of you are willing to give everything for Christ? To have that fellowship here. Willing to give everything. No matter what it costs me, I'm willing to give it. Paul said he was. John said that he was. You see, our lives have been changed when we come to Jesus. And we're under construction because we're under new management. And we've got to learn it. And we've got to learn to accept it. It's real. We've got to get humble. We've got to be everything God wants us to be because time is running out. I ask you again tonight, are you a Christian? And before we're so quick to answer that, we need to know how God defines it and what God says about it. If you're a Christian, he says, you're going to love me. But he says it a different way. If you're a Christian, you'll keep my commandments. Now, guess what? If we, if we can't keep the commandments of God, then God says you're not even a Christian. If you love me, keep my commandments. The opposite of that is if you don't love me, you don't have to keep them. But we keep some and we don't keep others. What does that make us? Fans. Not Christians. Fans. I don't want to be a fan. I don't want to be a fan. Tegan said this week while we were gone, he, or Jaxie, he was talking about one of his buddies at school. He said, yes, it He's a big fan now of, uh, I forgot which team he said. But he said he's a big fan of him, that team now because they're winning. That's exactly what he said. And that's exactly what I'm saying here. You see, I'm not a fan. I want to be a Christian. If I am, I've got to serve God the way he wants me to. And then I've got to be willing to suffer for you. I want fellowship with the Father. I want fellowship with you. Fellowship is two people working together in a boat. Fellowshipping. That's what I want in my life. Father, I thank you because your word is truth. Your word is life. God, I don't want to be a fan. Fans are hot and cold. In and out, up and down. Good and bad. I don't want that. God, I want to be a Christian. And you said that's one who has fellowship with you. And then that same person is one who has fellowship with the brethren. 
God, teach us what it means. Now, we've heard the truth tonight. I pray that we'll hear it and we'll understand it and we'll receive it. Fellowship, that's what I want. Help all of us to strive for it so we can be more like you and we can help the world to find Jesus before it's too late. I love you and I praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.